Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Jubilee City Church Live. Come one, come all. As the word says, where two or three are gathered in his midst, there he will be. He's right here with us. So go ahead and share the live for an extraordinary praise, an extravagant worship, and a word from the Most High God. We invite you, come on in, praise and worship with us today. Put your hands together right there. The joy of the Lord, and I'm trading my sickness, and I'm trading my pain, and I'm laying it down for the joy. joy of the Lord. Joy it will be my strength, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those sorrows may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm trading, I'm trading, I'm trading my sorrow. Will you trade your I'm shame? trading my shame. We're laying it down. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord.
give you a yes. We give you a yes. We will serve you all our days. We will serve you all our days, oh God. And for that, we will continue to raise a hallelujah unto you. We give you a
moment, God, we ask that you forgive us for any time we've made it more about our worship to you. Restore unto us, your people, what you gave David in your holy tabernacle, worship. It's all about 
It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. 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 Every knee will bow. 
Welcome to another edition of the Jubilee City Church Virtual Worship Experience. I'm so glad you could join us today. I want to give a special shout out to all of our members who are in their tea groups this morning. I pray that you all are enjoying one another, enjoying the Lord, and your hearts are prepared to receive a word from the Lord. And there's a word stirring in my heart. We're teaching this series right now on extravagant worship, and we're looking at part four of this series today. And I just sense this word is going to really minister to you, encourage you, and enlarge your understanding as to what it really means to be a, a true worshiper. Holy Spirit, anoint your manservant even now to speak as of the oracles of God. I rebuke the spirit of error. I release the spirit of truth and of accuracy. Let this word minister life to your people in such a way will never again be the same. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, what is this thing about extravagant worship we've been talking about? I want to look at a passage of Scripture out of 1 Chronicles chapter 15. If you recall, last week we left off in dealing with uh, Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And he showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. This is in Matthew chapter 4. We left off from here last week. And he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. All this is yours if you will bow down and worship me. So Satan is after our worship. He was after the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he told him to get behind me, Satan. Only the Lord your God shall you worship and nobody else. Else. What a profound response to the attack of the wicked one to take his worship. Well, to God, we understood the, the devious ways the enemy comes uh, to get us off of our word to the Lord and into our worship to him. If you're worshiping things in this world, then that means you're bowing to him. Why? Because Satan is the God of this world. So why is he after our worship? Think about this. Before he fell, he was Lucifer. He was the anointed cherub that covered. His whole thing was music, praise, worship, ushering in glory, leading the angelic host into worship. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, iniquity, self-will, doing his own, his own thing, was found in him. And five times in Isaiah 14, he said, I'm going to exalt my throne. I'm going to be like the Most High God. I'm going to sit on the side of the north. Over and over again, he said, I I, 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 I. He began to exalt himself. So he was removed from his place, his lofty place as a worship leader. And when he failed, God made sure he did not end up on Jupiter or Mars or any other, other, other planets in the solar system. God made sure he would end up on a planet called Earth. Why? Because God knew you would be here. And God put a worship anointing upon you. And your job is to worship in such a way that you bring torment to the wicked one. What does that really mean? Can you imagine someone losing a job and then someone else is hired to do their job better than them and they have to watch? So when you worship in spirit and in truth, the enemy is tormented. So he's doing all he can to hinder the worship of the church, us individually as well as the church corporately. A lot of churches, they're into their music, and I'm not putting down music. They have a real tight band and great singers and awesome musicians. I'm not putting any of that down. But if you have all that giftedness, without the anointing, it becomes problematical. We're going to be talking about that anointing as it relates to the tabernacle of David, as it relates to doing things after God's due order. So looking at this passage here, in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Chronicles, forgive me, 1 Chronicles. Chronicles chapter 15. I want to start reading in verse 1. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. David built houses for himself in the city of David. And he prepared a place for the ark of God. We'll be talking about the ark of the covenant today. And he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. Now, we're talking about extravagant worship. 
The word extravagant means uh, it has three major connotations. Number one, exceeding the limits that are necessary. Number two, that which is extreme or elaborate. Number three, to lavish. So David's worship personified this definition. And we're going to be looking at some things that relates to David being extravagant in his worship in a little while here. But actually the Davidic kingdom was established in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Actually verse 12 specifically talks about that kingdom being established. Also 2 Samuel chapter 6 the Davidic order of worship was established. In chapter 5 the Davidic kingdom of 2 Samuel. In chapter 6 uh, Davidic worship was established. So when they established that what happened was uh, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant. Kind of what we just got done reading here in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to its rightful place uh, in the city of David. But the problem was uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 3 they put it on a new cart. They made up their own way, their own style, their own persona as it were as to how they wanted to usher in the presence of God. This is a problem in the church today. We have tried to put worship on a new cart. Never tell people to worship God in your own way. The only way to worship Him is in spirit and in truth. So we have the body of Christ being engaged in all kind of styles and genres and new ways of doing things and newfangled ideologies in worship. I'm not putting doing new things down, but you cannot usher in the presence of God on a new cart. And so many churches have done that and are doing that. Now that has some real deeper uh, implications. When it talks about a cart, it says there a new cart. What makes up a cart? What is a cart made of? Think about this. Carts are made up of boards, wooden boards, and big wheels. Think about that. Boards and big wheels. That's what's running most churches today. Boards and big wheels. And God is saying, I want to usher in my presence. I have a certain mandate as to how I want that done. So in Numbers chapter 7 verse 9, God gives Moses specific instructions on how to move the Ark of the Covenant. It must be borne on the shoulders of those who come out of the Levitical priesthood order. They're the only ones who can handle it. They couldn't touch it, they could bear it on their shoulders. So, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back in 2 Samuel chapter 6, they were singing, they were shouting, they were playing their instruments, uh, they were glorifying God, uh, but they had it on a cart pulled by a, a yoke of oxen. And at a certain point, uh, as they were moving forward, one of the oxen slipped, and it caused the Ark of the Covenant to fall off the cart, uh, and a man named Uzzah put forth his hand to catch it, uh, because he was assigned to cover the Ark. Uh, when he put his hand up to catch it, uh, he violated what God said. God said, do not touch it, number one, and you have to move it on the shoulders of the Levites. When he did, God struck him dead. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. David was upset, but God didn't care. God had given specific instructions as to how he wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be moved. So the Ark of the Covenant was taken to the home of a black man named Obed-Edom. Isn't that interesting? It was taken to a to home of a dark-skinned man, the Gittite, a dark-skinned man. And for three months it stayed there. And your Bible says uh, God blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Why? Because of the Ark of the Covenant was in him his home. So looking at this, what they did then, they didn't do it after the due order. David got the revelation and began to do it the right way. And that's where we are right now in the passage I'm reading out of 1 Chronicles chapter 15. In verse 2 he says, then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. He finally got the revelation. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him how long? Forever. And David gathered all of Israel 
Notice it says here, not just a part of Israel. The Bible says he gathered all of Israel. So when you have praise and worship in the house of God, it doesn't just involve the Levites. They lead as singers, as musicians, which we'll get to in a little while here. But this involves all of Israel. And they gathered together at Jerusalem, later called the city of David. Why? To bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Then they would assemble the children of Aaron, the Levites, the sons of Kohath, Uriel, the chief, and 120 of his brethren, of the sons of Mariah and Asiah, the chief, and 220 of his brethren, of the sons of Gershom, Joel, the chief, and 130 of his brethren, brethren and the sons of Elizaphan, Shemaiah, the chief, and 200 of his brethren, and the sons of Ebron, Eliel, the chief, and 80 of his brethren. These are all of those going to be involved in leading, in singing, playing instruments, shouting, dancing dancing and leading God's people. Verse 10, the sons of Uziel, Abinadab, the chief, and 112 of his brethren. And David called for Zadok, my God, and Abiathar, and the priests, and, and for the Levites, and Uriel, and Asiah, and Joel, and Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Abinadab. He said to them, watch this, you are the heads of the fathers, the houses of the Levites. So once again, this follows the order of the Levitical priesthood that God had set up with Moses. And God wasn't about to change his mind because of David. So now David is getting it right. You are the heads of the fathers of the houses of the Levites. The next thing he says to them, get this, sanctify yourselves. Ah, you and your brother. In other words, I need all y'all to be sanctified. Don't you go near no music. Don't you go near no instruments. Don't you try to sing. Sanctify yourselves. We got a bunch of folk playing instruments, singing songs, going to lead God's people in praise and worship, and they have not sanctified themselves. That's the key to the anointing. Our problem is we can't differentiate between what's anointed and what's gifted. So we love gifted people. They bless us. They bless our soul. You heard folks say, oh, I love to hear her sing. Every time she sings, she just bless my soul. I'm not putting that down. We got to get past that, y'all. We got to go into the realm of the spirit. We need worship that captivates us in the realm of the spirit where we worship him in spirit and in truth. So he says here, sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren. All y'all get right with God. <laughs> that you may bring up the ark of the Lord. In other words, if you're not sanctified, you don't you go near that ark. Don't you try to usher God's people into his presence if you have not sanctified yourself the Lord God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, meaning they didn't go after the due order, the Lord our God broke out against us. We don't want God breaking out against people today. I dare say probably that's already happened. When, that, when God says, I'll have none of this. When God says, Ichabod, my glory cannot be here. When God withdraws himself, uh, he's broken out against us. Now watch this. Because we did not consult him about the proper order. That's how verse 15 ends. I'm sorry, verse 13 ends. Verse 14. So the priest and the Levites. They followed David's instruction. They sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders. That's what God originally instructed for Moses. By its poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of God, then David spoke to the leaders, the Levites. Why? To appoint their brethren. To do what? Watch this. To be singers accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. My God. So the Levites appointed Heman, 
the son of Joel, and the brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of their brethren, the sons of Miriah, Ethan, the son of Cushahiah, and with them the brethren of the second rank. So there was a first string and a second string. There was the first level of singers and musicians, and then there was a second level of singers and musicians. So now the brethren of the second rank, it says here, were Zechariah, Ben, Jehaziel, Shehem, Martha, Jehio, Unai, Eliab, Benaniah, Messiah, Mataniah, Elapahela, wow, Mekaniah, Obed Edom, Jehiel, the gatekeepers, then it says the singers, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan. What did it do? They were to sound the symbols of bronze. Zechariah, Aziel, Jehahamath, Jehiel, Unai, Eliahab, Messiah, Benaniah, with strings according to the Halamath, Mataniah, Eliphaz, Mataniah. Obed Edom, Jeziel, Azaziah, to direct with harps on the Shemineth. And watch this next one, verse 22. And Chenaniah, leader of the Levites, was the instructor in charge. There had to be somebody in charge. There had to be someone who was the point person, the leader. So in someone right, David wasn't going to talk to Eliab and Nathan Hanai and all those other people. He's going to talk to one person, and that's this person talking right now, Shenahiah. He was the leader of the Levites. He was the instructor in charge of the music. Verse 22 ends by saying, because he was skillful. He wasn't trying to figure this thing out. He wasn't trying to develop his skill. He was already there. So he was over. Everybody, all these folks with these crazy names, I just got their name in. One guy was over all of them. Why? Because he was skillful. Bechariah, Elkanah were doorkeepers of the ark. Shebaniah, Jehoshaphat, Nathanael, Amasai, Zechariah, Benaniah, and Eleazar, the priests, were to blow the trumpets. Now, Jubilee, you've got to get a hold of this part. There's a lot of talk about trumpets in these passages, and you do know. The Hebrew word for jubilee is yobel, and yobel means the blended blasts of the trumpets. So this has a lot of prophetic relevance to who we are as a house. Hello, jubilee. So David, the elder, took the elders of Israel and the captains over the thousands and went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord God from the house of Obed-Edom, the black man, with joy. And so it was. When God helped the Levites, when they do it God's way, go after God's due order, He will help us. He will help our musicians. He will help our singers. He will help our dancers. He will help those that are leading those into the presence of God. God helped the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That they offered seven bulls and seven rams. Seven denotes perfection. Seven is God's number of perfection. So God is looking for perfect praise, uh, perfect worship. Uh, verse 27, so David was clothed with the robe of fine linen. Now, this denotes David's ephod or his priestly garment. David had laid aside his kingly garment, his crown, and his kingly robes. He laid that aside, and now he's functioning uh, as his order of the priesthood. Now watch this. As were all the Levites who bore the ark, the singers, and Chenaniah, the music master. So this guy was a leader. He was skillful. This passage says he was a music master. He's a bad boy. We got to raise up some more of them right now in the, in the present day church. It's a part of restoring the tabernacle of David. We got too many good musicians in Detroit. Trust me. Is flooded with good musicians. They can play keyboards, they can play drums, they can play guitars, they are highly skilled, and we want that. But we need them to be anointed. 
We need them as David instructed them, the Levites, sanctify yourselves. Get in the presence of God. Have an intimate relationship with God. Be endowed with who He is. Be enamored with Him. We want them to have extravagant worship in their private life so they can lead the saints of God corporately into extravagant worship. There is no way. Carnal singers, worldly singers, carnal musicians, worldly musicians are going to lead God's people into the Holy of Holies. It does not work that way. And God gave specific instructions. When they violated it, it cost a man his life. They had to do it after the due order. I hate saying this. I don't even know if this has already happened. There could be people who are dead right now in the house of God because we didn't do things after the due order. Intentions were good. You, don't, you do know when they were bringing the ark back up, they had good intentions. Uzzah, who put his hands up to touch the ark, he had good intentions. But that didn't mean anything to God. God struck him dead on the spot. You think God's changed since then? No. He takes this thing still to this day very, very seriously. So, look what happens here. Thus, all of Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn and with the trumpets, hello, Jubilee, with cymbals and making music and stringed instruments and harps. I mean, all of this is going on, all this dancing, singing, clapping, shouting, uh, drums, uh, uh, trumpets blowing, uh, people shouting. I mean, this is quite a scene. This should be what happens in our church every time we come together. This should be all systems on go. Everybody's caught up. Everybody's focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, I wasn't going to read this verse. This wasn't in my notes. I was going to stop at verse 28, but I got to read verse 29. And it happened. <laughs> and it happened. What? As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, Saul's daughter, who was David's wife, looked through a window and saw King David whirling and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. You got to know there's some haters out there. When you are really into worshiping God with all of your might, extravagant worship, giving God your all, just like David did, leaping and shouting and dancing and praising, don't care how you look, don't care what folks think about you, there are going to be people looking out the window. The window denotes a perspective. So there are people that have a certain perspective when they see you going all out for God. Don't let them hinder your praise. Don't let them get in the way. You keep on shouting. You keep on dancing. You keep on uh, getting the victory where you're sitting at right now. You ought to just shout glory right now, right where you're at. Lift up holy hands right where. Don't care about the folk all around you. You are worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So now, this is a part of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. I want to look at 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse 14. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. Look at this. This is powerful. This is another rendition in the scripture of what we just got done reading about, where David is ushering back the Ark of the Covenant to its rightful place. And once again, verse 14, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. Extravagant worship. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. There it is again. This trumpet thing keeps coming up in the Bible. I believe that has prophetic implications for the house of Jubilee. There's some things God's bringing us into Jubilee. But we have to understand what that means and what is God really doing now. I want to talk to you about this whole tabernacle of David. I need to define it for you. There's a lot of talk about it. Very few people actually define it. Number one, there are two dimensions to the tabernacle of David. One dimension, or the first one I just got done mention, mentioning, is the Davidic kingdom. Under the auspices of the Davidic kingdom is government, ruling and reigning, warfare, 
justice, righteousness, peace, order, structure, authority, mercy, economic development. All that comes under the first dimension of the tabernacle of David. Then there's the second dimension of the tabernacle of David. And that is the Davidic order of worship. The Davidic order of worship. The components of that are praise, obviously, worship, dance, music, pageantry, poetry, the creative arts, the fine arts, the performing arts, the ministry of the psalmist, and seeking the Lord. All that comes under the second dimension of the tabernacle of David, which is the Davidic order of worship. Now, in these two capacities, David was both king, the Davidic kingdom, and priest, the Davidic order of worship. He fulfilled both of those. So, based upon this Old Testament precept, we've all been made to be kings and priests unto our God. We're making the dots connect for you theologically, okay? We're not just making stuff up. So, David was both king and priest. Now, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, we've all been made to be kings and priests unto our God. Why? That's a part of the tabernacle of David. So, thusly, the tabernacle of David can be defined. Get it ready. I'm giving you the definition with clarity of what the tabernacle of David is. It can be defined as the Davidic order of worship and the Davidic kingdom being established in the earth through the empowered church under the lordship of the Jesus Christ, the son of David, and thereby extending its borders up to the nations of the earth. Did you get that? Let me say it again. The tabernacle of David can be defined as a Davidic order of worship and the Davidic kingdom being established in the earth through the empowered church under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and thereby extending its borders to the nations of the earth. So when you understand that dynamic, it carries some very serious implications that are evangelistic in nature. Now what does that mean? I want to look at Amos chapter 9. And in Amos chapter 9, God actually says he's going to do this. He's going to restore this tabernacle called David, called David's tabernacle. In Amos chapter 9, verse 11, once again I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Oh, I love this. He says, on that day. Now, the context here is referencing the last days, okay? So, that's where we are right now. On that day, God says, I will raise up. I'll come back to that term, raise up. The tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. So, now, church, uh, it has been fallen down. We we're not doing the way the due order explains uh, that I just got done reading to you. We don't raise up and train holy God anointed singers, musicians who have sanctified themselves. We have no longer ushered God's people into his presence under the auspices of the Ark of the Covenant, which notes God's glory, God's presence, and the apparentness that God is there. God dwells here. So it's no longer in a building. It's no longer in some, uh, some material made by man. Now it's among his people. So he says here, he's going to raise that up and repair its damages. So we're in, an, in a time right now where God is repairing those areas of the church where we begin to get off in our worship. We're worshiping worship. We're worshiping things. We're so caught up in doing it the right way with technology and, and, and sound systems and we put so much energy and time to make that right and miss the essence. Now the tail is wagging the dog. So now he's raising it up. Now he's building it back up. He's raising up its ruins and rebuilding it as in the days of old. Why? Because he wants us to possess the remnant of Edom. 
Why? And all the Gentiles, my God, who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. So God is saying there are Gentiles, people who don't even have a covenant with God, people who have never been saved. Now, why is this important? Under the old covenant, with the Ark of the Covenant, the Mosaic Law, that was only for the children of Israel. It was not targeted towards anybody else. God said, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. I'm going to lift you up above all the nations of the world. You are my specific treasured people. God was intentional about that. That was under the tabernacle of Moses. Under the tabernacle of David, the walls have come down. Now the Gentiles can come in. Now people that have no covenant with God whatsoever. God is going into the different spheres of the world and there are people who don't even know but they've been called by his name. God chose them before the foundation of the world and they don't even know it. He's going to use the tabernacle of David to do it. One of the elements of that will be the music, the praise, the worship, the music, the dance. The poetic flow. All of that's going to invade every sphere of culture and society. And there are people who aren't even born again. There are people who ain't thinking about God. When they hear this, why? Spirits travel on the wings of music. So when you have an anointed musician, an anointed singer, and they begin to play, and they begin to sing in the marketplace. I have seen this work firsthand. I know this work. We've taken praise and worship in malls. I remember. Well, before I got in ministry, I used to work for a company called Fort Motor Credit Company. And uh, I, had, I did a lot of intervention between Fort Motor Company, Fort Motor Credit Company, Fort Land Development. Uh, and there was a mall called Fairlane Mall. And Fairlane Mall was developed by Ford Land Development Company. And when I worked at Fort Motor Credit Company, I remember when they first opened the mall, they let us salary employees go and do a walkthrough. And no one else could get in. You had to show your ID. But we did a walkthrough. While I was walking through the mall, I saw this little area outside of Sears. Um, it was like a little play area for kids. Uh, people could sit there and have coffee or whatever. This is back in 1976, y'all. And I thought, it would be great. Back then I sang with a gospel group called the Followers of Christ. It was an all-male group. We sung a cappella. I went to the management of Fairlane Mall. And I asked them, can I do a concert with my group uh, in the mall around the time that you, you all open up? And they met and they gave me a call to my office and said, yeah, you can come over. So I signed the contract. They gave us some specific instructions. Um, and I told my group, we scheduled it. And we went to that mall, put our loudspeakers up and begin to sing glory unto God. Begin to give him praise and worship. All of a sudden, the entire mall gets arrested. People were walking all, taking, coming down the escalator later, standing all up on the upper level, and people were lifting up their hands as we were singing and glorifying God. Why? We arrested the atmosphere. Understand, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And when the church begins to get outside the four walls, part of this pandemic thing, he wants us to get outside the four walls and take this glory throughout the streets. Take this glory in the park. Take this glory in the mall. Take this glory out in shopping centers. Take this glory and reach the Gentiles. That's what this verse is saying. Now, how does this work? He said he's going to raise it up. This word, this term here, raise up in the Hebrew is one word in the Hebrew. He says he's going to raise up its ruins in verse 11. Raise up in the Hebrew is one word. You ready for this? It's the Hebrew word Gwen, spelled Q U W I N. Raise up in the Hebrew is the word Gwen, spelled Q U W I N. Here is what it means, my God. It means to arise with strength. Ha! It means to come on the scene with vigor. It means to become powerful. It means to be fixed, to be valid, to be proven, to persist. So this word carries the idea of something that once was functional is now being made functional again with vigor, with strength, with power. 
that's how David was. David wasn't no weak little pushover. David wasn't the kind of person you want to tick off. Trust me on that. David was a mighty warrior, but David was a mighty worshiper. You could call him a worshiping warrior. So now, God said, I'm going to raise up this tabernacle of David. It's been torn down. My people have lost their vigor. My people have been, been victimized by religious ideology. They don't worship in spirit and in truth. We don't have musicians that when they hit the keyboards, all of a sudden demons start screaming just because of the way they're playing. Now, a B-flat chord is the same as far as how it sounds to the natural ear if a sinner is playing it or a believer is playing it. But it depends on the tree that's bearing the fruit. What does that mean? A corrupt tree can only bear corrupt fruit. A tree that's holy, that has holy branches, will release fruit that's holy. So when a drummer is holy, when he beats, something is happening. Every time he hears that beat, boom, 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 demons are trembling. I'm talking about minstrels. I'm talking about those that have an anointing. They've been dipped in oil. They have an anointing upon them. And when they play, they play with this vigor. They play with this strength. They play violently. This is how we're going to come against the powers that be. The kingdom is suffering violence, and the violent take it by force. So I'm giving a clarion call out to every singer, all the psalmists, all the musicians, all the keyboard players, all the drummers, all the guitar players, all the horn blowers, all the musicians. I'm calling for all the dancers. Consecrate yourself. Sanctify yourself. It's time to go to new level. We're taking music back. We're taking dancing back. We're taking everything the devil has stolen. We are taking it back. It belongs in the church. Well, that's the devil's music. The devil don't have no music. He has perverted what God created and we've been okay with it. Well, what about all that hip-hop stuff? The devil didn't invent that. Rhythm and poetry, David did that. The Psalms are rhythm and poetry to music. David did that a long time ago. We're going to see next week. You don't want to miss next week. David invented instruments. We're going to share something about what David did and what that's required in, the, in today's church. We'll get to that next Sunday. You don't want to miss next Sunday. But please understand, Satan has no music. All he can do is pervert. So now God's moving the church into a new dimension. It's called the high place of praise, the high place of worship, the high sound, where we're piercing the darkness and confronting and assaulting the ruling principalities. Certain principalities are not going to be dealt with until the church goes to that warfare mode in praise and worship and dance and shouting. There's a sound that pierces the darkness. There's a sound that goes to the high place praise. Let the high praise of God be in their mouth. Let the high praise come out of their mouth as a twisted sword that cuts down the enemy. We cannot be the same old, same old we've been in days gone by, church. There's a new sound out of Zion. There's a prophetic sound. There are songs being birthed right now. There are musicians that are going to their instruments and they're creating new stuff they've never done before. Why? It's a part of the tabernacle of David. You gotta know David wasn't just a normal guy. David had something in him that would not let anything or anyone defeat him at any given time. David was the most masterful warrior probably in human history. David took territory. David took land. David invaded areas where Gentiles dominated and all of a sudden established the Davidic kingdom there. Now, everybody, you got to worship my God whether you like it or not. I mean, David was a bad boy. David did some crazy things. I can't get into it right now. And like, David, what were you thinking? How, how could you do something like that? But because he had this deep thing with God, this deep longing for the presence of God. He would cry out to God like, as the deer pants for the water, but God, my soul longs after you. He had this deep yearning to 
experience God in a fresh new way. This one thing I desire. I just want to dwell in the house of my God forever. Whoa, who thinks like that? Who prays like that? David did. David had this demonstrative worship where he would dance and shout and, and stomp his feet and twirl around. That's what was going on in the past we just got done reading about that made Michael, his wife, angry at him. That's undignified. You're the king. How could you be jumping up and down and twirling and doing all this crazy? Don't you know people are watching you? When you get into true worship, you don't care about people watching you. You're so caught up into him. So now, as we're restoring the tabernacle of David, or should I say, as God's restoring the tabernacle of David, like he said he would, through the present day church. Let me say, how do we know this has anything to do with the church? Because once again, in Acts chapter 15, there was a, a, a real confrontation and conflict with the church in Acts 15. And James quotes the passage I just got done reading to you. And he tells the church then in Acts chapter 15, he said the, the main church was Jerusalem and James was the lead apostle there. And he tells them what this verse says. God said in the last days, he's going to restore the tabernacle of David and rebuild it. That's where we are right now. So church, Jubilee. I want you to set your heart not on a building, not on us all being in one place at one time that we're going to get there. I want you to get so intimate with God during this time. I want you to have in your private devotional time, time when you know the, the weightiness of God's presence has flooded your place of prayer where you worship. I have songs that I sing to Him and I get deep and I lose myself in Him as I worship Him in the beauty of holiness, the weightiness of God's glory is in my room or wherever I met when I worship like that. I don't want to just wait till I get to the corporate gathering where we have a bunch of people coming to church waiting for something to happen with the glory and the anointing and they don't have it in their personal life. That's not how this works. Well, if all of us, all of us have this weightiness of God's presence, this tabernacle of David experience in our individual devotional lives, what do you think is going to happen when we're all doing that and we all come together in one place? My God, my God, my God. Now, I'm giving you a chance to do that. I'll even be announcing pretty soon. We're going to be having a time where we all come together in a few weeks. I, I'm giving you a little headway. I want, when we come together in a few weeks, uh, the whole house of Jubilee, I want you in a place, when you walk in that place, uh, you come in with your spiritual saliva gland secreting. You're coming to that place uh, like a thoroughbred horse, uh, waiting for the race, waiting for that certain sound to take off in the spirit and praise and worship and shouting and dancing. Uh, we're going to have a good time because we have experienced God in a new, fresh way as he's restoring, rebuilding the tabernacle of David. My God, my God. I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray that you begin to get a hunger and a thirst for his presence like you never had before. That you, as David wrote, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after thee, O God. That there's a longing in your heart to experience him in a fresh new way. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you're drawing your people to a new dimension of intimacy with you, a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of praise, a lifestyle of intimacy with you, where worship is a part of not just something we do, it's who we are. Let the Davidic anointing be on the house of Jubilee like we've never known in days gone by. I release that over every man, woman, boy, and girl, over every household. I release extravagant worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you don't know the Lord, today is your day. If you're watching or viewing this program uh, live on Facebook and you've never been born again, it's real simple. You have to accept the radical lordship of Jesus Christ by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and you will be saved. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, go ahead. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross just for me. And right now, with great boldness and confidence, 
I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my Master, as my Savior. Come into my heart. Make me brand new. I renounce the world and the devil. And from this moment forward, I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and welcome to the family. My God, my God. I want to give you an opportunity to give and to sow seed into the ministry. We do have financial obligations and we need our people to be consistent in giving of their tithes and the offerings and gifts of love. And I just, I just speak the word of God over you continually, perpetually. God's favor. Those that may be struggling, those whose businesses aren't flourishing because of this pandemic or those who are laid off. I just pray that supernaturally God is working things out in your, in your favor. And you can give three ways. You can give by Cash App, Dollar Sign, Jubilee City Church. You can give by Pay Simple, Jubilee City Church, or Tithely. And I want to encourage you to be consistent in the giving of your tithes and offerings and gifts of love. I want to pray over you right now. Father, I speak your word over your people. And as they prepare to give and to honor you, to worship you with their substance, I release the power of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, where your word says, My God shall supply all of our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And for this, we are so thankful. I mentioned in the context of my message that we're going to be getting together pretty soon. The whole church coming together as 1 Corinthians chapter 14 speaks of. Uh, we're going to be meeting at the Victory Ranch on September, I believe it's the second Sunday, I believe it's the 13th. Um, and we're going to give you all the details about that in the coming weeks, but I just want you to put it in your calendar. We won't be meeting in homes on that Sunday. That's the second Sunday of September. It's the Victory Ranch in Northville. We're going to give, we'll give you the address. It'll be on our website at jubileecity.org, but I'm going to be making an announcement for the next few weeks leading up to it. Don't worry about it. Just put it on your calendar. We'll be meeting on that that morning. I'll give you the exact time uh, next week. We'll work all the details out right now, but please, uh, we need the entire church to be there. We're going to be shouting, dancing, worshiping, praising our God. We'll give you more details on protocols, all that good stuff, uh, but please, I look forward to seeing you then. What a time we've had together today praise and worship. I pray this word ministered to you. I pray this word had relevance to you. I pray this word penetrated your heart to cause you to be birthed in a new dimension of extravagant worship. I look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, God bless.